I think we're also talking about uh, one of the thrusts of the NEM new economic model, which is inclusiveness. So if, um, yes, who would like to? Maybe I, I return back to the same point. Yes. How do we make sure that the ETP connect with people? Uh, very simply, I see it two ways. The first one is to, increasing, to increase income of people. And the second one is to find a way to reduce the cost of living. There are only two things. Picture a human being as if your company has got a profit, it's, it's got a revenue side, which is the income of the person, it's got the cost or the expenditure side. Let's talk about income. What do you do to raise the income? Create more jobs, more high paying jobs. That's one of the things that most government do. So we have created quite a number of jobs already that was created, that was more than, in fact, last year alone, 400. 1,000 people have now taken up more high-paying jobs, according to the DOS numbers. So if you ask those 400,000 people, they will say they have got more money this last year compared to previous year. But you've got to ask them to open the account. So that's one. The other type is, instead of creating jobs, we want people to create entrepreneurship. That means create their own business open more businesses to then make more money. So that's on the income side. There are no three types. Either you are having more jobs to create the income, or you create your own business. There are no only two types for creating the income side. So on both sides, I think they will see some growth. Now on the cost of living side, the, even if you didn't increase the income, if you can mitigate the cost to keep it low, people will feel the impact. The one thing that you can talk about Malaysia, Malaysia is one of the highest subsidized countries in the world. From last time, we had a lot of subsidy on sugar, from flour, cooking oil, from petrol, from LPG, etc., etc. Et in fact, the last time that we increased our hospital bill, if you go to hospitals, so in 1982. So that was, if you went to government hospital, you paid that amount of money, that, that peg was there in 1982. Cost of living has risen, but we still kept it the same way. And so the government is doing a lot of things, but that's not sustainable. Over long term, that's not possible that we keep on doing that. So we have to find a way to gradually reduce subsidies so that it's sustainable. Along the first axis that I said before, we had to create more jobs. Now, those are the two things. Now, the third one is the role of government. Social safety net with that was Sri Subramaniam in, in that. He was sweating last year, I must say that, because we challenged him to implement minimum wage. Because when we put minimum wage at 900 ringgit and 800 in Sabah and Sarawak, by the act of implementing that in January, 3.2 million people in Malaysia, their lives has greatly improved because they move out of poverty line. 3.2 million people. So that's a very big impact. So, I mean, when you talk about it, I do want to say today, thanking employers for agreeing to do it, collectively by just doing that one single thing, because that is social welfare. I cannot imagine that we as a country reach a high income status when 3.2 million people are still below poverty line. That is not acceptable. That's why we took a very strong view in government and that to Sri Subramanian and, and the ministry, they did a really great job in moving that forward. What, that was one of the key ETP deliverables. I think that directly impact 3.2 million lives, very directly. Of course, there are many other examples. The most visible thing that I see today, we don't experience it yet, all the digging around Kuala Lumpur for the MRT. I can tell you, when we finish the MRT, 50% of us who live in Kuala Lumpur will find tremendous improvement in the quality of life uh, because we have the option now not only to get caught in the traffic jam, but really now to breeze it either to drive, but you then have to, but it's a big project. So that is, if you think about it, 6 million people live in Greater KL. If 50% are positively impacted by the MRT when we complete it, that is 3 million people. By the year 2020, 10 million Malaysians will live in Greater KL. That's a third of every Malaysian, you know. By the year 2020, we had 31 million people. If 10 million in Greater KL will positive benefit from the MRT, you will see real impact on lives of people, in my view. Thank yeah, you. I just wanted oh. to add, uh, perhaps, 
one we have to look at the, from a historical perspective as well. Back in 1970, uh, we have some 49% of Malaysians living below poverty lines. And uh, we have since improved it uh, down to 1.7% as of 2012. So now that's a tremendous uh, improvement. Now, of course, uh, if you look at, based on the latest, um, the last household income survey, uh, we still have uh, some 40% of the households uh, that still earn uh, below 3,050 ringgit uh, per month. Now, uh, that's why from the government's perspective, uh, we are going to do more uh, in terms of uh, addressing uh, this group of people, the bottom 40%, uh, to make sure that we are able to improve uh, their income level so that uh, when Malaysia achieves that 2020 high income status, uh, they will similarly experience a significant increase in their income. Thank you. I think uh, the biggest challenge, of course, we want to be a rich country. We want to be a developed nation, 15,000 uh, US dollars per capita. This is the challenge. So the issue is how do you, how do you get there? And this issue, issue of disconnect. Some people are not part of this uh, mainstream. Yeah? In the villages, Sabasra, for example. So that's a big challenge for us. So the, the question is, how do we become a rich nation, developed nation? Investment, the types of investments, the skills, education, going into research and development, design development, MRO, those kind of things. So uh, for us in government, uh, we have uh, in, uh, uh, between the two of us, myself and Grace, we've got this investment committee. We're tracking more and more these kind of jobs. That's very important. I mean, the bottom line is, we want to be a rich nation by the year 2020, a developed nation, 15,000. So it is important for us to be more focused in ensuring that we become a rich nation by the 2020. There are challenges. Number one, of course, uh, we have states which are lagging behind. We have regions which are lagging behind. We have Sabah, Sarawak, Kelantan. So this is a big challenge. I mean, it doesn't make sense for Malaysia to be a developed nation if there is no inclusiveness. If some parts of the country, some regions in Malaysia, some states are left behind. So, this, again, is another challenge. One is the challenge of raising the average income to 15,000. Perhaps a more, a more challenging job for us is how to make sure the lagging states, Sabah, Sarawak, and Kelantan, and other parts of the country, move up in tandem with developments of the country. So we, we have to come up. I mean, this uh, session is also about looking at some new ways of ensuring that you know, we, we achieve this inclusiveness. Uh, small medium enterprises, of course, very important. We have 600,000 of them. We have to really transform them. We've got to upgrade them, technology. So, uh, if, if you ask me, frankly, uh, we have to work harder, small medium enterprises. We have to work harder to ensure inclusiveness and getting Sabah, Sarawak and other lagging regions of Malaysia to be part of the mainstream. That's a challenge. And this is, uh, 2013 is behind us, but 2014, Perhaps we should be uh, uh, moving more and more in the direction of how to ensure that there's inclusiveness in this uh, development that's, that we are experiencing in Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you would like to say something. I was going to open up the floor. Just uh, one quick point is, of course, in the, in the process of economic transformation, we also are faced in transforming the type of industries and that type of industries which will actually attract to this country. Uh, if you look probably in the early 70s when, or late 60s, when industrialization first came to Malaysia, most of the industries which came here were actually very labor intensive, requiring very low skills. And at that point of economic development, probably that was appropriate because it actually gave opportunity for a lot of people to get jobs. And through that, actually income of families went up and it assisted. But at this point in time, I used to have these uh, discussions with Dr. Sri Mustafa while I was the HR minister. We were faced great problems with industries asking for lots and lots of foreign workers to be brought into this country because the nature of the industry was so labor dependent. So we said that I think Malaysia is not in a position anymore to actually entertain uh, this kind of labor dependent industries because one, because we already have got shortage of labor, and number two, as our, our population skill sets and knowledge increases, then the type of industries which we really attract to this country, we should be more knowledge and skill based. So I think transformation of the investment and transformation of the type of industries which come into this country is also very important uh, in actually enabling that Malaysians will get high value added jobs and through that, of course, uh, uh, enjoy a higher level of, uh, of, of lifestyle. And uh, these will involve transformation, for example, the glove industries. They were very, very labor de uh, dependent one day and we, were, we are one of the leading exporters of gloves in the world and we were to actually 
continue with our competitiveness, it was an imperative need for the industry to automate, which they actually they have, they have done. And uh, by so doing, they actually reduce the need for manpower and being able to actually manage their competitiveness. So that's the kind of transformation which we need. Thank you. Um, I think now it's your turn to ask the questions. So I would like to open it to the floor and um, please state your name, where you're from and uh, who you'd like to answer your question. Hello. Uh, a very good morning and assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to all the uh, YBs and also to very good morning to all the audience. Uh, I would like to thank uh, the ministry to invite me. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sam Sitingani. Uh, I am from uh, Mission New Energy, a renewable energy company based in Australia. But uh, for the last uh, almost uh, 30 years, I'm involved in the uh, plantation industry. I would just like to raise, uh, I'd like to have a few questions, but uh, the moderator says there's only one question is allowed. At a time. At a time. So I'll start with one first, then I'll continue with the second one. Is it okay? Uh, well, let's see if there are others who would like to ask this. Okay. Uh, my first question is, uh, since I'm from the plantation industry in the palm oil, uh, I would like to raise this uh, matter. We have been talking about these uh, automation and, uh, you know, uh, labor intensiveness of all these uh, industry. But uh, I will say this industry or the palm oil sector has been very comfortable zone because of the margin they make. So the need for them to go into automations or a renewable source of energy is not a very highly demand at this moment of time. But there are also uh, companies are going backtracking in the words, they're buying more plantation land and increasing the workforce, the labor workforce. And as a result of that, our YB, uh, Dato Subramaniam have said that uh, uh, the labor intensiveness is increasing and there's a demand for foreign labors. If you go to any plantation companies now, I'm sure about these, uh, the manual workers are basically foreign workers. So I think this is the industry I, I hope that uh, uh, all the ministries will work towards automating the industry to a very high level. I hope that will be uh, my first question. Thank you. Who would like to answer that? Maybe I'll respond to that one. On oil palm, I agree with you. We do, we do need to improve uh, the uptake of automation in, in, in oil palm. When we started uh, the lab, that was a big challenge that we put forward in the team. They identified one very important automation was the equipment called Chantas. It's a very long pole for those people that know. It's just a motor at the bottom. There's a sickle at the top that they use that instead of climbing the tree, you can then put on the motor and it cut it. But of course, if you start doing that, two workers become one worker. So obviously, if you ask, you invite Turkey for Christmas, they will always don't turn up. La. So there's a lot of people resistant to using the tool because if you use the tool, then one of the worker will be out of a job. So which of the worker will volunteer to say the tool should be brought in? So there's a lot of challenges. And there was another challenge that related to it at the time. There was the cost of doing it. When we first started, one unit, I thought, if I remember correctly, my memory might fail me, but so 3,000 to 4,000 ringgit per unit. We then got the ministry together with the agency to bring down the cost. We brought down the cost. Uh, to uh, 2,000, and then eventually we brought it down to 1,000 ringgit, again 1,500, etc., with some assistance. We still struggle. The big players, a lot of the big plantations took the, the equipment, the chantas, they began to use it. But many of the small and medium uh, companies didn't really take it on. So we decided to move on and say, okay, why don't we, you create for yourselves cooperative in your plantation, so then we will give loan the, the tool for free. So the government went out to do that. So we put it for free for the cooperative so then they can start to use it. We still struggle with people wanting to use it. So my take today is that there is so much addict, addiction to, uh, to cheap labor. We really need to wean them out from, so that we start doing that. So 
quite a lot of progress has been made. I must say, in the main, I would say 60% of our progress has been made. There are, I think, 40% more to go with regards to doing that. Of course, we're still asking people to go and do more automation on the oil palm sector. But more importantly, let me, let me uh, move to the next area, that we've also started to ask the oil palm industry to go into more downstream activity producing a lot more of products that are high paying oleo derivatives, et cetera. So that, that is a lot of grants have been granted, given to them to set up more refinery to get down to doing that. Many of them have started to do this. KLK, for example, they've put in a lot of investments in this area. And this in area inherently is a lot more automation that's involved in the downstream rather than the upstream side of the business. So rest assured, we are with you. We are pushing the agenda on automation. We are pushing a lot more of diversification into the downstream where there's higher yield at the same time, a lot more automation that's being used. Next question. Yes, this one, uh, the gentleman over there. Good afternoon, Dr. Um, my name is Ananda and I'm from uh, FAM. First of all, I'd like to thank ATP, um, that really Idris Jala's leadership, and also um, all the efforts that's been um, really putting forward. Myself, I lived back in England for some time, and then I've uh, actually heard about ETP through medias and uh, so on and so forth. Um, being a Malaysian living abroad, it was always uh, um, a, a note another Malaysian always tells me when I um, bump into them, they used to say like, or why do you have to go back to Malaysia when we're not really doing much well there? Um, I think that so far, um, I'm very proud to be a Malaysian, and um, I got a few points that I'd like to um, address to the ministry. Question, main, please, yeah. Mainly on uh, education itself. Um, I think that our schools uh, need further um, um, contribution directly to the um, career and down, uh, counseling department itself, because I believe there's a lot of stakeholders that are involved, like teachers, parents, and communities, and uh, also students itself. So I think the Education National Blueprint has also also addressed it, but I think there need to be a more uh, emphasized uh, thing going forward in 2014. So what are the takes that uh, the ministry is looking at? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'd like to take another question. Do we lump two together if there's another one? There's one uh, in front so here. So that's uh, the question on education. And uh, yes, there's one, another gentleman here. Uh, my name is Greg Pratchetti. I'm ambassador of Thailand. I'd just like to uh, ask about uh, Malaysia uh, preparation for the ASEAN community in the year 2015, how EPU and all the economic uh, <coughs> ministry prepare for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we'll, we'll do those two questions, one on education and the other on uh, uh, AEC. So let's, uh, education? AEC. Oh, AEC uh, first. Okay. It's got to do with um, economic integration among ASEAN countries. It is uh, an objective we all subscribe to. We're all working hard. 2015 uh, is the year that we hope to be able to realize AC, MITI, and a few other ministries. We are in the forefront of uh, efforts and initiatives to make sure that we're on track. There are some challenges, uh, but uh, based on our uh, tracking of the um, progress, we are, uh, we're going to be there 2015, except it's going to be perhaps at the end of 2015. The economic integration, freer flow of goods and services, connectivity, inclusive development, but more importantly, tariff, non-tariff barriers, standards, harmonization, rules and regulations, sharing of best practices. So this is very important. And we, we've set up a national task force uh, to make sure uh, that all the objectives will be met. Uh, which Putra, and we also involved in that as well. Miti, of course, is very much involved uh, in AEC. So thank you for that. But on this subject, competition is very important. As Malaysians, we have to be aware that we, 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 we are in an environment of more intense competition. As we run, others are running faster. Of course, ease of doing business, well and good. Number 12, number six. 
big uh, movement. That's, that's, I mean, this is welcome news, but others are running. So we have to be aware that we are living in an environment of more intense competition. I'll just give you an example to our Thai ambassador. I'm at the border. There was a time when the income gap between the Thais and Malaysians was about, probably about, I mean, uh, one third. And that was about 40 years ago. Now the gap is closing, you know. I, just an example. Huh? So I, I think as fellow Malaysians, we need to be aware that the competition is getting more intense. Therefore, we've got to improve rules, regulations, governance, transparency, all these things. And that, that's part of SRI, Strategic Reform Initiative, which Miti is very much involved, is to deregulate. Yeah? So that's one. On education, uh, needless to say, we, we've got to do a total overhaul. I think uh, uh, out there, people are very impatient. They want things uh, done. So I think the government is aware of that. And uh, 2014, I think, is a very important year. Thank you for that reminder. All of us here, there's 31 of us. Yeah? We'll have to work probably um, next year, early next year, we'll have to uh, convey this message that is very urgent, it's got to be done quickly. We are all very impatient to see uh, marked improvements in education, otherwise uh, we're not going to be able to achieve some of the goals which we have uh, decided for 2020. Let me just add to on education alone. Uh, just to emphasize how important and how seriously we're taking this on. You know, the quality of English has not been as good in our education system. So a lot of people saying that some of our teachers are not very good, not very proficient in English. We took a very bold approach in the ministry led by DPM. We took all the English teachers, those teachers who teach English. Towards the end of last year, every single one of them had to go for a Cambridge placement test. All must go. People in other countries told us, look, Idris, if you do such a thing in the UK, asking English teachers who've been teaching for 20 years to sit for a test, you probably have a strike. But we took that approach and we still proceeded with it. So all 70,000 English teachers sat for the Cambridge placement test. I have to tell you the bad news is that, this is in the public domain now, the information, 70% of, the, of them were not very good. So what do we do? We took a very drastic approach to get all of them to go into training. We, together with the British Council, all those teachers that didn't quite make the standard, they are going through evening classes, afternoon lessons, etc. Going through a very serious approach to doing it. So I want to relate to you the story that we are not philosophical about it. We are taking concrete measures. So if you're philosophical about it, you can say all sorts of things, but at the end of the day, how do you improve the quality is you get down to the teachers, but on a name basis. Individual teacher who cannot make it, take them out for classroom. Really make sure that this is done properly. So we're taking, if you are, very, if you are interested to know what we're doing on education, read the National Education Blueprint. It's a very thick document that there are 11 shifts inside there, very specific things that need to be done. We have set up a, a, a unit called PADU, the, not, not Pamandu, PADU, Performance and Delivery Unit for Education, with a CEO fully dedicated to making sure that we make success in education. My view today is the following, I'm just going to tell a story. Two months ago, I was invited to make a speech at the Dayak conference, about 1,000 people there. They asked me to speak on what the Dayak should be doing for the next 50 years, and I was given one hour. I said, if you're giving me one hour to speak on that subject, I don't have enough to say I, can, I need only five minutes. If you ask me the subject is, what is the Dayak going to do in the next five years to 10 years? You give me one hour, I can say many things. But what is it that you needed to do in 50 years? Actually, the answer is education. Education, education, education. That's the answer. In 50 years, if we don't up our game in education, we will be overtaken by other countries who run faster than us. So it's absolutely key. The longer term agenda for poverty eradication is education. I came out from poverty, eh? to be clear. To me, rural development is education. Competitiveness of nations is all education. 
So that is what we know in government, the Prime Minister and the DPM. That's why we put both higher education and Ministry of Education under one umbrella, because we cannot have them split. We want to put tremendous focus. There are two ministers involved, full ministers involved in doing this. That shows how important the agenda is. I think no stones shall be left unturned. I would say today, if there was one thing, I'm not a politician, eh? so Wahid as well. <laughs> if there's one thing that we both hope that both Barisan National and Pakatan lay down the sword and not politicize, is education. They both must come together and agree what do we need to do, and then agree, forget about arguing about education, but that this one area, I believe, you can argue about many things, but don't argue about education. Thank you for that, yes, well said. Is there another question? Just Yes, in front here, there's a gentleman in front. Your name, your occupation, uh, where you're from, sorry, and uh, one question. Selamat tengah hari, uh, saya Ahmad Fadli Kesi, pemberita daripada Malaysia Kini. Uh, soalan saya mudah sahaja. Uh, berkenaan uh, ETP ini, uh, apabila kita mengambil kira tahun 2014 sebagai tahun yang akan menyaksikan uh, beberapa kenaikan dalam uh, kos uh, sara hidup, Jadi saya fikir mungkin ramai uh, mereka di luar sana berminat untuk tahu bagaimana program uh, yang akan disampaikan di bawah ETP mampu membantu untuk mengurangkan kos sara hidup sebab di atas kertas kita sudah jelas bagaimana program ini akan meningkatkan pendapatan tetapi daripada segi kos itu masih kurang jelas. Terima kasih. Thank you. Thank you. He asked about the cost of living and how it relates to the man on the street. Uh, terima kasih Saudara Ahmad. Uh, tentang peningkatan harga untuk uh, tahun depan ini, ini telah pun dibentangkan ke kebanyakannya uh, di dalam bajet 2014 kita dan uh, pertamanya uh, adalah uh, untuk kita meneruskan uh, langkah rationalisation of uh, subsidi kita uh, dan uh, dengan itu uh, akan uh, beberapa uh, barang akan uh, meningkat. Uh, satu lagi dalam konteks kita untuk memperluaskan um, revenue base kita uh, di mana kita uh, perlu uh, uh, memperkenalkan satu percikuaian uh, yang lebih efisien uh, itulah GST yang kita nak uh, introduce tu. Uh, memang bakal terdapat peningkatan uh, harga barang tetapi kita harus uh, melihat dalam konteks uh, pertama sekali kadar peningkatannya adalah kadar-kadar kadar yang menasabah uh, keduanya kita juga perlu lihat di mana kita mempunyai offset uh, package. Uh, sebagai contohnya um, uh, entitlement untuk BRIM itu kita uh, telah uh, mempertingkatkan jumlahnya dan uh, orang yang layak uh, juga telah dipertingkatkan daripada mereka yang uh, hanya uh, berpendapatan uh, kurang daripada 3,000 sekarang ni yang berpendapatan 4,000 ringgit juga uh, bakal uh, mendapatnya. Jadi ini untuk memberikan sasaran yang lebih kepada golongan yang memerlukan. Uh, kita juga telah um, uh, mencadangkan supaya kadar cukai uh, dikurangkan. Uh, Sebagai contohnya cukai pendapatan um, dikurangkan antara 1 hingga 3% dan juga uh, kadar threshold di mana uh, pembayar cukai dikenakan kadar maksima ditingkatkan daripada RM100,000 kepada RM400,000. Uh, ini bermakna sebagai contoh mereka yang uh, berpendapatan uh, bercukai sebanyak RM100,000 uh, bakal uh, menjimat uh, sebanyak RM1,950 uh, setahun dan uh, bagi mereka yang berpendapatan uh, sehingga uh, RM400,000 uh, mereka akan uh, menjimat sebanyak RM27,000. Uh, Jadi ini merupakan uh, antara langkah-langkah yang kita uh, buat untuk memastikan bahawa rakyat uh, dapat uh, menangani uh, peningkatan uh, kos. Uh, jadi uh, sama ada dalam bentuk uh, income support uh, ataupun uh, dalam bentuk uh, pengurangan cukai. Terima kasih. Ini satu of course, a very tough issue for government, any government in the world. Eh? Kerana kita ada legacy, uh, mana kita bergantung banyak subsidi and the government has acknowledged that there will be a modest increase in prices. To say that there will be no price increase at all, it's not correct. Ini kerajaan has been very open about this, that there will be a modest increase. Although it's small, 
and uh, we think it's going to be one off. So that's point number one. But more importantly, uh, apa pilihannya? What choice is there? Kalau kita business as usual, we do nothing. Um, deficit will go up. There will be inefficiency. Yeah. Um, there will be excessive use of resources which are depleting. Uh, there will be an impact on currency rating. I mean, I just will give you one example lah. Kalau kita uh, pursue the current policy of uh, do nothing attitude ni, uh, deficit at four five percent. Yeah. Pressure on currency on the current account. You know, you know, Malaysians will be you know more adversely affected. Yeah. The, the perception about Malaysia. Kalau lah currency further depreciate lah umpamanya lah. Katalah, we do nothing. This is a real possibility. Then the whole, the slow ride Malaysia can juga akan 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 will bear the burden. So it's tough for government, but it's a responsible government. We got to look into the future. We got to be, uh, we got to look at, we, we got to be objective, and the government is determined uh, to rationalise. But yang penting juga, we're doing this gradually. It's not in one first swoop. I mean, it's going to be done gradually over many months. Eh? Uh, jadi uh, yes, of course, kerajaan kena uh, get buy in uh, ke rakyat memahami uh, tapi rakyat kena faham bahawa kalau kita if we do nothing uh, the country is going to be facing uh, deep problems and very serious issues in the future